Some years ago, I was driving past Donegal Airport early on a winter's morning. I pulled up, jogged to the beach and took a quick look around. No one was about. I, <laughs> I stripped naked, le- left my clothes and glasses in a pile on the sand and jumped into the freezing ocean. <laughs> After about 20 minutes, I was coming out when I heard that unmistakable voice. <laughs> Young Joseph, what a sight for sore eyes. It was Gay Byrne out for his morning walk on the strand. I see you're making trouble again, he said as he strolled on. Do make sure to keep it up. <laughs> Mickey Hart here. You're listening to GAR Football Show. The GA Hour with Colin Parkinson is brought to you by Paddy Power, home of the Money Back Special. I'm not finished yet. It took me a long time to get here. We'll start off with county finals, uh, Conan, and I suppose the big story out of the county finals is East Kerry hammered last year's All Ireland finalist, Dr. Crokes, two fourteen to one seven. That's after Dr. Crokes kind of got a, a late goal by Gavin White. So a really convincing uh, win for East Kerry, and all the talk in Kerry is how Dr. Crokes dominated the last decade, but there's another team going to dominate Kerry club football for the next decade, and that's East Kerry with the age profile of the team. And the fact that Rat Moore were relegated to intermediate this year, which frees up Paul Murphy and Shane Ryan um, to go play with them. Darren Minahan wasn't even available yesterday because he was out injured. They just seem to, they seem to, even though their team isn't littered with names that w- jump out at you, you know, it seems to have be a lot of uh, younger, um, talented players. Yeah, and there was an amazing picture with David Clifford and Evan Cronin afterwards. And, Two of them look very emotional, hugging each other, and I thought, Jesus, such a great advertisement for regional teams, isn't it? Like you know, and all these players who aren't playing senior football have now won a senior club championship. It's, yeah, it's unreal. Like the, the just the, the scenes afterwards, I didn't think they would care as much playing for East Kerry yeah. than they would for their clubs. But for, for them to be that, um, yeah, for 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 them to be that close and that well managed, yeah. we we know all of we've talked before about the challenges that these area teams have. Um, it's Spa, Glen, Fles, Glen. F- Flesk and Fossa and Ratmore and all that area mm. that how to just get them together when they have their own club championships to worry yeah. about so there would be an element of a League of Nations about it where they just all join together and Harlem Globetrotters and they don't train they don't, <laughs> yeah. like, they don't like each other they're yeah. rivals as it is but they definitely seem to work I saw that picture that you're talking about now the cap- Kerry captain is going to be from East Kerry which like I mean it has to be David Clifford in my opinion I know he's only young but the other option is Jack Sherwood Darren Minehan you know, I don't think Paul Murphy or Shane Ryan just because Rat Moore has to be from who played with them this year. I think Kerry have fallen into this trap before. Jack Sherwood isn't guaranteed to start for Kerry. How can he be captain? And why? Another question is why are Kerry persisting with this antiquated uh, uh, kind of policy of making the the captain come from the county champions? Yeah. Most counties have moved on from that now. Who's your captain? Like that's like, who is the captain of the team? Exactly. Pick Stephen him. Cluxton would never be Dublin captain <laughs> other than under yeah. this. Like it's madness. It is madness. Um, it's it's good though. I think David Clifford would be a good captain for him, and I know he's young. But Michael Murphy was he one year out of under twenty one yeah. when um, yeah. yeah Donny Gold made him captain twenty twelve, and he was a natural fit. I remember thinking at the time that he was young, and now you laugh at yourself now, yeah, looking yeah. back. And yeah. Clifford holds himself like a captain, like he you know he's got real inner belief, and it's like now he knows he has to go win games for East Kerry or Kerry. He knows he's the main man. Like I think he'd be a great choice. Yeah, because there's enough pre- people say there's pressure too much pressure on him. David Clifford has more pressure on him than any other yeah. player in the country. That's not going to add greatly to it. He's not a sh- he's not a shy individual. He's you know he's well able for it. Mike- Michael Murphy is a great example. And the thing is, he's guaranteed to start. It causes too much nonsense. Because I tell you why, Jack Sherwood's captain picked as captain he doesn't start now it's thrown on David Clifford without ever having to you know process yeah. this in his mind or become a good captain so like it is silly it's it's a silly policy anyways but if you're going to do it he's the only one that's guaranteed to start his brother put his hand up to be in the mix uh, next Potty. year but that might be a bit too much pressure on Potty <laughs> um, but yeah so it's, an, it's, a, it's definitely an interesting one it's something Kerry need to sort out it really is. It really is. I was actually just thinking at that game, the, the Austin Stacks were, would they have been training? Well, that was it. I texted a friend last night, so they have been training. Yeah, they've been training away because the 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 play, train away during the league. But the fact that the fact that uh, Croaks were in semi finals with three uh, uh, area with three teams. area teams, yeah. and the fact that East Kerry were so strong, Austin Stacks have had a an idea that this was going to happen right. and it's after coming coming true now can't imagine they're training at the intensity that a yeah. team knowing they're playing Nemo Rangers so now they play Nemo Rangers next week a team that didn't win Kerry 
against the Nemo Rangers uh, team who just scraped over um, Newcastle West at the weekend. It doesn't have that much of a, a kind of... This is a... Cora Finn's All-Ireland to lose again, really. <laughs> no, but yeah, it is. No, it is. Because you have four teams in the semis in Ulster that have never won an Ulster. Never yeah. mind getting into an Irish semi-final. You've nothing coming out of Munster. You've Ballyboden or Portleash. Ballyboden or Portleash would be decent, but you'd imagine Cara Finn would handle either of them. If Cara Finn hold their heads, yeah. they're, all the rest are dropping around them. <laughs> but they're doing their best to not hold their heads as well. Like We'll not analyse the game here, but um, yeah, they don't look as convincing or scary as they used to. Yeah, yeah, but they get scary in Croke Park. Yeah, they just true. need to get to Croke Park. <laughs> yeah, a bit of dry <laughs> land underneath them. That's it, exactly. The other county final was St. Thomas's. Uh, the kind of time that lay to beat uh, Lee Mellows. Uh, Lee Mellows were um, 11 7 up at half time and they scored 11 points from the first 11 shots. And St. Thomas's came back to, to beat them in the end. Very interesting that Finton Burke, who was injured, did his cruciate in the All Ireland club final against Bally Hale uh, back in March. I remember that happening because he'd been playing well in that. I'm pretty sure he's wearing number seven that day. He was supposed to be gone for the whole year, battled his way back, came on in the second half and scored two points, which pretty much won the county final for his team. So that's a nice little story there. Yeah, that's amazing. What's the longest injury you've had? Like, have you been out for that length of time before? Uh, No, not really. Not really. Probably not that. No, not. I just can't comprehend, like, you know, being told you're out for the whole year. So we start focusing on next year and then these people then just somehow get it back for a county final of all things. That's the thing. The weird thing about the club is that, you know, that All-Ireland final, it, uh, you, you know, the six months that he needed would get him back for the end of this year yeah. in, the new, in the new competition. So it, it's definitely a weird one. But congratulations to him. Um, David Burke was flying in the midfield as well, apparently. In the other county final from the weekend, Clonmel commercials, hammered J.K. Bracken so a little bit disappointed J.K. Bracken is their first ever county final new enough club um, you know that they look Clamwell commercials we know how good they are and when Ballyboden won the All-Ireland Club in 2000 and was it 15-16 they were steeped to get over Clamwell commercials in Port Leash in the All-Ireland semi-final do you remember that? Yeah. The, all the steps that were taken for the equalising point no, by their know. captain Nelson Um yeah, so Clonmel Commercials are a very good club team. So they'll have a say actually in that Munster Championship now. They play Milltown Malbe um, next week while Austin Stacks play, play Nemo Rangers. You know, so it's not, uh, not too bad. Cora Finn, we'll get into the provincial matches as well. Cora Finn obviously beat Ballon Tubber. This was a boring enough match to watch. I was watching it. Like it was all over when Cora Finn went six up, one yeah. nine to six. I made the mistake of Googling the result. It was like, well, okay, this, <laughs> this is a little bit boring. Did they hammer them or did it? And yeah. then I was like, oh, Jesus, Ballon Tubber make a game of it. I might just keep <laughs> watching. Hang on but it was, and Currafin got a few nice points, but they never really caught fire. You know, when Currafin score a point, it's usually very easy on the eyes. Yeah. So remember Lundy gave a lovely bo- diagonal ball in and it was laid off to Farraher and, uh, you know, yeah. it's a, but, you know, they're just not, they don't seem to be the huge force but the weather and the time of year and they're just coming off winning a county final replay last week and they probably celebrated that and they just didn't look to be firing on all cylinders. Yeah, they were quite deep as well, weren't they? I mean, Gary Sice, it was a brilliant turnover in fairness to him, but I was like, what's he doing? Sice was dropping here? way deeper yeah. than he usually did and that was one thing that I noticed and their manager said after the game, Kevin O'Brien, he says, we lost control of the game after going six points up and gave away some frees. We were getting players back, but we were getting them back a bit too deep. We did it in a few Galway Championship games too. So it's an area to work on. And that is not a feature of Cora Finn. I know yeah. that they can drop bodies back around the middle third, but the word Sice never drops that far back because Sice is an option to move the ball on if yeah. they win it back. And, and like, it, it didn't look any... And it's not like Ball and Tubber have this lethal full forward line that they needed to do this. It was a weird one from Cora Finn, unless they've changed their tactics slightly this year and maybe that's why they're, they don't look as impressive. Yeah, maybe it's a response to all these club teams who are flooding men forward. So it is becoming a bit more basketball-esque. But Ian, Ian Burke was out around the middle of that as well. And you're like, ah, oh, man, get, get back inside. Yeah, Use your don't hands. mind Burke, but I definitely saw Sice running back without chasing a man. Yeah. He was running back that way as in he's coming back to cover a space. Yeah. It's like, that's not He Cara was Finn. very... 
deep, yeah. He was yeah. like behind the half back line at one Now, stage. he did get taken off, which is unusual for size. So. Right, yeah. But I did, like, uh, I remember keeping an eye. Like, the ball got turned over. He turned one over. And twice I was sort of keeping an eye on the bottom of the picture to see if he would come bursting back in this. But he was coming very late onto the play. And just luckily for him, the, the play was slow. So he was able to get back involved yeah. again. But And plus, I spoke to him on the show. He does not have the engine for that one. Yeah. We joked about the fact that he, that's, the, that's, that's not what it. he wants to be doing. So it's a, it, that was definitely a weird one. And I noticed that. Killian O'Connor was up to his old tricks anyways. Standard Killian O'Connor. Um, Kieran Fitzgerald got a punch in the side of the head yeah. as he was going past him and the hands went up. As in, I did. Now, I have to say, was it Clunk had got a yellow card on Sice? I thought that was a that harsh enough. Unbelievably harsh. Yeah. Now, we know we've talked about this in the intercounty game. You actually can't slap a fella. You can't slap the ball if a fella's holding it in his chest now. If you could try to slap that, you know, like you always would, let's try and get it out. Yeah. The, the player is taking that hit and they're flying backwards and it's looking like yeah. a clothesline. And they're screaming as well. What Plunkett did there was n- there was nothing wrong with that. It was an aggressive kind of slap to dislodge yeah. the ball and Sice made the most of it and got a yellow and they're all doing this. It's gone to the point where that tackle is a waste of your time, especially if run- someone's running past you at speed. They will take that impact and they will lift their feet up off the ground and they're down on their back. Yeah. And it looks in real time like a clothesline. Yeah. They ha- players just have to stop doing it because I'm not sure how we can stop players from from taking the hit and making the most out of it. Yeah, and like the ref was so sure it was a yellow card offence because like, they obviously just saw the impact, probably heard something and he was having none of it. Like, you know, and it, was, it reacted so quickly to it. But when you saw it slow down... It just it was, was not a yellow card. It was nowhere near no. his neck or face or it just no. came across his chest. And would you say you're disappointed with size there? I, I would know. slightly because I know when Sy started playing the game he never would have done that Yeah, he, you would have rocked through that hard impact it would have slowed you down but you're not flying back yeah. you're all flying back now I think it's disappointing but it's hard to know how to stop is it diving or is it a forward going right well he's made sure to put a good hit onto me it's going to slow me down it's aggressive and I'm going to make the most out of you you know what I mean yeah. I, I think the lesson here is for pl- if a player's running past you do not put your hand out to slap the ball or you could el- you could easily get sent off. I'm trying to think of the equivalent if I was in that position and like it's at centre back like you know when you feel a strong hand on you like that you're, you're stopped somebody's got a hand on you so you're in big trouble and there's going to be bodies around you the ball's just thrown in I would be dying for a free in that situation because otherwise I'm going to get turned over on the 45 so in a way it's not like I'm condoning diving but I can see like if I felt the contact I would definitely be looking at the ref trying to like you know, get a foil out of it just to save yeah. myself from losing maybe, the ball. Maybe it is a, a, a byproduct of all the players that are back now that if you're slowed down, you could be surrounded. So yeah. if he slows me down with a good get hit, I'm going to hit the ground because I get the free because yeah. I'm not going to get too much further anyways. Do you know? But like, I mean, the, the, a lot of the time why I would say to defenders not to do it is how often do you see a ball being dislodged yeah. in that scenario anyway? You don't. It's yeah. often a token gesture to hit and you're being silly because he's just going to fly back. Mm. I'm repeating myself now. You're, there's, if a fella's flying past you, he's going to use his four steps with the ball tucked tightly in his hand. You're not going to dislodge it usually. Yeah, it's, it's usually in any form of tackling, like you wouldn't like this. It's it's the second man who d- dislodges it. Like, you know, so if uh, Plunkett stands up strong there and just stops Sice, Sice will turn around, try to take a solo and somebody else will be in then to take it off. Yeah, like that's, yeah. that's the person who usually turns the ball over. But, it sort sort of sounds like we're um, excusing Killian O'Connor. His was straight to the face. That was not like the no, Michael Plunkett. No, no, that was a clear yeah. yellow card. That was yeah. that was a, a dirty challenge, really, because he probably he looked like he knew what he was doing, and he dived for a penalty as well. Killian O'Connor did in the first half, and he clearly dived. He didn't appeal it. He got straight up and started chasing his man. But I don't know. I've seen him doing this before, and I don't think that's uh, like just because he runs after his man and acts honest and goes oh well I, I didn't appeal it he still did it so if that f- penalty was given he'd ha- he'd stand up and take that penalty the fact it wasn't given he jumps up and chases his man like oh well I didn't appeal it well now in some way I wasn't looking for it but you dived yeah. you made the referee make that quick call and just because you're acting a little bit honestly after that doesn't cover the dishonesty of the of the dive in the first place yeah it's, it does look like he's just trying to give the referee a decision to make like and as you say if he got the penalty he would definitely take it he wouldn't say ah no actually yeah because he did go down looking for a penalty yeah like, you know? yeah and that's sort of what he seems to do anyway in his general play he would hit somebody a slap and put his hand up and carry on or he would go down carry on 
you know, he'd be involved off the ball, a third man tackle, but look like he's not doing anything. Carry on. I'm starting to think like he's a madman on the field. He's <laughs> <laughs> like he's a loose cannon of the highest order. Yeah. He's just I think he just loses because you hear interviews like he's a totally level headed fella. Mm. Um, but he definitely turns into a, a, a crazy man on the field that just win, a win at all costs mentality type thing doesn't yeah, it? Yeah I think we talked about this before I think you were saying that maybe he just needs to go to that place to be focused in the game like you know like maybe that's just what he needs to be doing playing on the edge and and doing these things, like he just doesn't seem to care about anything else other than what's happening on the pitch. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a it's a weird one. So talk to me about this slot nail uh, Dunlai um, rivalry, or was there a rivalry? Because uh, I saw the slot nail manager of slot nail won the Ulster final for the fourth time in five years, or the third time in four years. Third time in four. Third yeah. time in four years. Um, a fired up slot nail manager Mickey McShane said afterwards we're coming out to prove ourselves you saw out there who was the best hurling team so like the kind of fighting words <laughs> coming out after a team that's after winning so unless there was a little bit of over and back between the two camps before this I know slot nail lost the cushion doll last year so they lost their, their Ulster title mm. and maybe you're a little bit hurt by that yeah I mean like they played Dunloy in 2017 in the Ulster semi-final and Slock Neil went on and, and won Ulster. Um, back then, like Dunloy, the sort of feeling was, and there was interviews sort of in the build-up to this week, was that the Dunloy team was very young and right. they've, they've grown up and they've got like two years of physical training under their belt so they, they thought that the gap would be narrowed and I think that game sort of hurt Dunloy as well because they were six points up and Slock Neil just came back and beat them and yeah, maybe there was a bit of I don't know if disrespect is the right word, but like you know, people just assumed that Dunlop perceived would be disrespect. Yeah, you know, these sensitive players. Oh, when oh, they said yeah. they're a better hurling team than <laughs> us, <laughs> and it doesn't take much because you were showing me this quote this morning, and I was like, oh, well, Chrissy McKay just posted something about so-called experts as well. Like, so <laughs> you know, this could just be a prediction at the bottom of a newspaper round up or whatever. <laughs> but I'm sure, look, we know all about it with the Glenties boys as well. Like, it doesn't it doesn't take no. much to fire people up. So yeah, like there there did seem to be that maybe Sock Neil sort of like the Guido thing. Just a bit sort of, yeah, felt like, you know, hang on a second, we're the powerhouse here in Ulster. Like, you know, why are yeah. people just overwriting us? Yeah, so they need anything just to, to get that bit of motivation. Brendan Rodgers scored three from play. I'm always fascinated by full backs who play in the forwards <laughs> yeah. for hurling or football. Uh -huh. Kind of over and back, how you can change your mentality to be a forward in hurling but be a full back in football I don't yeah. know it's just it's a weird one you're e you either choose to be a defender in all codes when you're younger or you choose to be a forward you can't uh, just mix and match this Rogers. my god though you would love him as a hurler like he just gets the ball head down and runs like, like he does a stock yeah the pretty much like. he's, a, he's a, f a as attacking a full back as you'll see yeah he's a runner like, I remember like he's, as football in fairness he used to always be wing back with stock Neil and with some pass Mahara and he was just this powerhouse wing back but um and he was just playing wing forward for Derry when he broke onto the scene because he was playing with hurlers before football and like he's a massive loss to there now he still plays in the Ulster Championship for them but geez, he was, like he's a joy to behold OK right well I must watch that all there in semi-final so that'll be an, in an interesting one Port Leash won in the Leinster Championship uh, very dramatic circumstances we know Derry Gonnelly um, beat uh, uh, Trillick, Trillick uh, the week before with a sudden death penalty this wasn't sudden death penalty because St. Pat's missed their first one so Portlaoise just had to make sure they scored all five and they scored all five so they won 5-4 on penalties so that was interesting Graham Brody came on as a sub and scored one of the penalties you'd be uh, like you like to hear uh, <laughs> Conan uh, not really surprising really that Graham Brody put his hand up to take one of the penalties Craig Rogers got the winning penalty he obviously missed a penalty against Kilmacook Croaks uh, last year at a really important time uh, a penalty that he hit very well it was the Bally Bowden uh, goalkeeper cho guessed the right way oh, and, yeah. and got, got his hand to it uh, Roggy stuck it in the bottom right this time the last against Bally Bowden he tried to whip it in to the top corner actually it was a very confident penalty but he missed it and both managers Niall Rigney and Casey O'Brien are saying the same thing after this match Port Leash, by the way looked like they were going out they were 2-7 to 10 points down in extra time um, Pat's got a goal in extra time you know in these real low scoring games now you're in extra time and you can see the goal Port Leash looked like they were completely gone and yeah. they battled back and they got their own goal um, to stay in it so they showed a lot of heart even though Port Leash uh, continue saying that they're not playing that well 
uh, this year. But Niall Rigney and Casey O'Brien were saying the same thing. Niall Rigney said it's, it, w- it was an awful way for any team to lose. I've never seen anything like that in football uh, before. It's tough on Pats. They're probably the dominant team for a long time, but we show great resilience to come back into the game. Good analysis at the end there. He's probably right on that. Casey O'Brien said it looks like we're going to get over the line, but a draw after extra time and then losing on penalties is a cruel way to go out. We would have no problem... Uh, going down to Port Leash and playing a replay. Uh, maybe if you play it on Wednesday night under lights, it's a better way of going out in penalties. I disagree that that's a better way of going out, that you're going until Wednesday night now and it's stepping over on your next game preparations. It's absolutely not. Why are people so against penalties? Because I saw Richie Donnelly tweet about this over the weekend and he's deleted the tweet since. Oh, has he? He was giving out about for- foreign mechanics deciding GA games. And here's the thing. Penalties are penalties. So one, a fella misses a penalty. Well, then do we ban free kicks because a fella might have a free kick to win the game and he might miss it? Yeah. So what, what is the problem here? Penalties are part of the game. So if there's a penalty in, in, in the last kick of the game in normal time, that's okay. But deciding on a game on, on a penalty shootout is not okay. That's cruel. It's, it's, part, it's, it's already part of the game. You're using it to decide it so that it's a shootout and it's not going to a silly replay on a Wednesday night under lights yeah. and ruining the game we, you know ruining a team's preparation for the next round it's, it's a great way to finish games it's great drama I'm delighted it's in GEA and I don't know why this it, uh, do you know what it is it's without thinking about it and they're just copying the kind of you hear it in soccer oh it's a cruel way to go out <laughs> yeah well is it any more cruel than any way to go out yeah exactly Player, players miss points from play it's very there's cruel. A, there's a villain at the end of every match mm. because somebody's messed up or somebody's done something. Yeah, that's it. It's cruel, but it, like, someone has to be decided. Like, and I actually thought, I, I, again, I look at the Glenty's example, I think it's more cruel to make them play three games yes. and then play three ta- days before. Much crueler. Yeah. Much crueler to go play a county final on a Wednesday night, celebrate it, and then have, have to take a day off work on the Thursday to celebrate, the, you know, the next day, and then yeah. have to play at the weekend. That's bloody cruel. Yeah. Finish the thing. And you've been, like you've been given sixty minutes to win the match, and then you're given an extra twenty minutes to go and win the match. You know, so you've got the chance to go and decide it there and then, like you know, and there's plenty of opportunities to do it. The, the Richie Donnelly thing, the the foreign sport, like I, remember, I just thought, like his penalties are they a new thing in in GA? Well, that's like, the where, thing. <laughs> where they're, are you they're the, part of the game. Exactly. We like, haven't just borrowed these just for yeah. the shootout. <laughs> we've taken a thing that we do in the game. It's like right, we've tried everything else. Now let's do this to finish it. And off. it's important to point out that we've tried. Uh, free kicks from the 45 and they were bloody dull oh terrible they were crap and from reading about this I didn't see this now but uh, from being on a a whatsapp group of lads that were down at it like that was great excitement even though it was a freezing cold day but it's gone to penalty you tell me any fan in the world doesn't love penalties they love them yeah the drama of them is fantastic it's it's like it's why everybody talks about the Champions League being the best competition in the world. Now, there's a lot of elements to that, but a lot of it is that, like the second leg always goes to penalties, and it's yeah. just brilliant. Like, how many times have you been watching extra time and you're like, I just forward it on and <laughs> let's get to the penalty. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> like, get rid of extra time straight to penalties. <laughs> <laughs> we, we solved it. <laughs> there's a lot of games I would like just to be decided on penalties without even playing the, the yeah. two teams playing each other. <laughs> um, so Port Leash now go on to play A Rogue, who beat Sarsfield pretty well. So that was a turn up for the books. Uh, Pretty surprised um, about that. So that's going to be a fantastic semi-final between Aerog, who've won five Leinsters, and Port Leash, who've won seven Leinsters. Two traditionally strong uh, Leinster teams, two neighbours, and um, not sh- that'll probably be a, a neutral venue. So definitely looking forward to going to that uh, between two great clubs. Um, uh, talking about Carlo, our friend Stephen Poacher um, announced last night that he's leaving uh, Carlo. So I don't think anyone in Leinster football will be have any kind of uh, tears in their eyes about him leaving Leinster football. It'll be a much better uh, championship not having him in it with all of his an- antics. And ironically, I suppose, for a self-promoter like Poacher, he leaves Carlo in exactly the same position he found him in, um, in Division 4. Um, coming off a couple of absolute hammerings the year before, Mead beat them by 15 points and Longford beat them by 10 points. So you can talk about your, you can self-promote and you can do what you want. And a lot of team, a lot of managers always say and coaches always say, I like to have left the team in a better position than I found them. 
Unfortunately, that hasn't been the case for our buddy uh, Poacher. I have nothing more to say on that, Conan. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, like I, th- I think he, he <laughs> well, did. <laughs> <laughs> in fairness, to our buddy Poacher, he, like you give him a few like moments in the sun, him and Turlock, um, that yeah, they will the Kildare, remember. The Kildare win will be the highlight of his of his uh, time with Carlo. All uh, all cruelty aside, that was a fantastic uh, kind of ambush mm. on a Kildare team that weren't expecting. None of us were expecting Carlo. Um, to do that didn't evolve them over the time came back mm. with the same game plan um, got in p- problems with referees got suspended and uh, to be honest with you outside of uh, outside of some people in Carlo I don't think anybody would be too uh, worried about not seeing him involved mm. with an intercounty team but anyways it's a cruel way to end the segment yeah <laughs> <laughs> not a segment it's just that story it's about the penalties uh, here's, here's a nicer little story is a uh, is Gary Castle beat Ratot, uh 311 to 212 it was a convincing enough win Ratot, uh scored 1-4 without reply at the end to you know to make it look like it was close but it wasn't um, they were missing Brian McMahon for some reason I'm not too sure interestingly here Desi Dolan went off at half time which is par for the course <laughs> had a chat with his brother <laughs> and then the other manager decided he's taking him off which is an interesting <laughs> one is Gary Castle were 1-9 to 5 up at half time so the 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 Dynamic of this, we know the county final, he was whipped off because they needed to shake it up yeah. with a big man, the edge of square. This game was under control um, when Desi went off. He'd scored three frees. His brother, Gary, who is co-manager, not manager, he, um, his partner or wife, I'm not sure, just had a baby the night before. So he was up in the middle of the night. So he got home just the next morning, get a couple of hours sleep and uh, went then to collect Desi to go to the match. So I thought that was a nice little uh, story about that it's not like he had to play or anything he was just on so maybe I don't know he goes and uh, collects Desi the next morning and then takes him off at half time so I don't know <laughs> uh, it's nice it is a nice it's a nice little story it's what yeah. club football is all about isn't <laughs> it, it surely is, I'll yeah. take your line right <laughs> <laughs> like you see, he must maybe only has thirty minutes, and I thought he retired. Like that—that's the real beauty of all this. That he retired after the no, county final. No, he retired from Westmead Club Football because he'll never be back there again. Oh, yeah, right. yeah. So he hasn't th- retired full stop. He's, to be honest with you, he's going to retire now when they go out. This lad's milking it of the highest <laughs> order. You can't retire from. So he's retired from intercounty football. Yeah. Then he retires from Westmead Club Football, and now he'll just retire full stop. <laughs> we'll never play football. He'll have three. Mark O'Shea had two, and we we're slagging yeah. him. Well, he's retired from Leinster Court finals now <laughs> <laughs> semi-final yeah yeah that's a good one yeah you could do that after every round uh, right there's another two stories I want to finish up on here we'll we'll uh, cover one or two more of the club matches in performance of the weekend obviously Desi Hutchinson is coming up um, in part two but the Clare County Board have reported social media abuse to police so Joe Cooney has said that a complaint has been lodged but with Clare GA by an employee, which is Pat Fitzgerald. It arises um, from social media and what has been put up on it, not alone over the la- past couple of months, but the past couple of years. So that's uh, uh, Davy's father. I think he gets a lot of grief on social media and the county board has handed it over to the police. Um, uh, Joe Cooney continues on other officers of Clare G have also been badly maligned on social media it's not good enough for people working as volunteers for the GEA whether at club or county level to be subjected to that in fact it's a disgrace now I don't know like I mean I was reading the Clare champion and he said that one of the they said one of the main sources of the abuse is the Clare 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 Facebook page <laughs> you know like I mean kind of characters you're going to have commenting on this and saying stuff now I don't know what was said so it's hard to comment on it I just kind of think when you know the police are under resourced um, you see what's happened up in Cavan and uh, you know kidnapping and torture because police are under under resourced and then you have the Clare County Board crying about some abuse on social media I'm of the opinion just don't read it or unless it's something completely liable you know or, yeah. or, or defamatory jeez if it's saying you're useless at your job if it's if this is the kind of level then grow up but you, we d- I don't know what the level of abuse was so it's a difficult one I just think in the current climate after hearing what happened in, yeah. in Cavan to be handing over to the, to the police comments on a clear 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 Facebook page I'm, I'm <laughs> sorry I'm a little I, I wouldn't be kind of doing something like that yeah no and like the fact that it's Facebook is a little bit um, interesting because 
most people they don't have anonymous accounts on Facebook, you know. So even know who it is doing it, and is they're there obviously no happy to put their name. To, well, you could, but like most people with their Facebook yeah. page, it's just their own page. The person themselves. Yeah, yeah. it's much easier to, to create an anonymous Twitter account. People tell me, I don't know, <laughs> um, but. And then, like you know, the the Claire, Claire, I don't think they would do this, but they can moderate that. And if there any, if there is anything libelous, they could, they should just take it down just themselves. Block like, it. That's what the police would tell them to do. Like you know, start this out yourselves. To like, me, you this know. looks a little bit precious. Now, again, I have to qualify this all the time by saying, I do, if there was something yeah. serious being said, then I'm you know not being fair on them here. But to me, this is a county board being a little bit precious mm. it almost like and this sounds a bit mad but like it's, it nearly comes with territory with a county board job doesn't yes. it like you don't take it to be popular like there's every other club in the county you're not going to like what you're up to you know like no matter if you are doing a good job or not like you're going to have people who who don't like what you're doing so yeah it's like you, you think these people have a thick skin anyway again we don't know exactly what was said but yeah yeah stay off the Claire 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 Facebook stay please. off on stay off my my, my opinion on social media and Twitter and things like that and is if you're anyway sensitive stay off it it's not for you there is assholes all over the place you can't say anything without someone disagreeing with you or taking the, the polar opposite um, opinion of what you said or else twisting what you said and creating some sort of controversy out of what you said these are people are complete and utter Muppets mm. avoid the, the social media. I do that now more uh, more so than ever, and I'm much happier in my life for doing it. Yeah, I always think of it when I see like Facebook comments like that. I always wonder, you know, if one of my mates like posted a Facebook comment that would pop up on my feed that they'd done it, and I'd be like, "What the? F- what are you asking?" Like, oh, you yeah, know, you yeah, would like yeah, you know, yeah. you start writing back to them, slagging them off, or tag your mates, and they go, "Look at this boy getting all hot under the collar." And, you know, it doesn't really happen in in the real world. I don't think it seems oh, yeah. like these people who would be posting it maybe don't have that much going on, and it's just like, yeah, this is where they're getting their fun, just having like you know a rant at somebody, and they're not getting attention from anybody else. Yeah. Doing this, yeah, exactly, exactly. No, that's a good point. Come here, I want to finish up on this one because this is the greatest of all time. I'm <laughs> I'm officially naming this the greatest uh, article I've ever read. So, <laughs> just to give it a little bit of context, you know. Myself and yourself might be a little bit suspicious about whether Joe Brawley's articles are actually fact or fiction, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, you know, we think he's definitely liberal with the truth yeah. on, on his articles. He meets a lot of people. They're entertaining. There's no doubt mm. when, he's, when he's going at something, like I enjoy reading it, I take it with a pinch of salt, especially whatever about the article itself, the anecdotes. <laughs> <laughs> the anecdotes that set set off the article or are in part of the article that he meets somebody on the street and they just happen to say something that perfectly fits in <laughs> with the point he's making. And it's and usually you were right, you. <laughs> <laughs> but this beats everything. Now, this is in a GEA article. It's about an article he wrote on Gay Burn, but I just have to read this out because it's just <laughs> <laughs> so fantastic. Right, so it starts off. I'm reading this now. I'll read the whole thing and then we can talk about it. <laughs> he's brilliant. <laughs> Some years ago, I was driving past Donegal Airport <laughs> early on a winter's morning. I pulled up, jogged to the beach and took a quick look around. No one was about. I stripped naked, left my clothes and glasses on a pile on the sand and ju- just jumped <laughs> into the freezing ocean. After about 20 minutes, I was coming out when I heard that unmistakable voice. Young Joseph, what a sight for sore eyes. It was Gay Byrne, out for his morning walk on the strand. I see you're making trouble again, he said as he strolled on. Do make sure to keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> right? So let's just break this down. Now, that's the start of the article. Oh. So Joe Brawley was just driving past the Donegal Airport and passed by a beach, decided to get out of his car, no towel, no nothing, stripped off all his clothes, <laughs> got into the freezing cold water. <laughs> right? Okay. Now, this is in the middle of winter. After about 20 minutes, he got out. Like hypothermia might have kicked in before then. So then like when Gay Byrne just happen, happens to be walking along this deserted beach in Donegal walking his dog. Gay Byrne. <laughs> the chances of all this being true is about a million to one. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it has to be. Yeah. It has to be. How did Joe plan on drying himself had he not met Gay Byrne? When Gay Byrne met him, was Joe not shivering that Gay might have said, Jesus, Joe, you all right? You've been in there for 20 minutes, Jim. <laughs> Joe, will I call an ambulance? Yeah, but no, but Gay was completely, like, he wasn't taken aback by any of this. He just said, I see you're making trouble again. And in, in my head, he sort of had walked past him at this stage. Yeah, And he's yeah. looking beyond and just says, do keep it up. Yeah, do make sure to keep it up. And then, so, do you not want to chat, Gay? No, no, Gay's gone. That's the end of their interaction. <laughs> it's over. 
So basically this article was all about gay burn, about how gay burn wouldn't last in RT now because uh, their need for balance and their bland. And it was a, basically an attack on RT mm. using gay burn to pretty much if you had replaced gay burn with Joe Brawley, that's pretty much what the article <laughs> yeah. was pretty much about. So like, I mean, it was a tribute to gay burn, but. Whatever about the article, it's not our business on a GA show. But that intro is just, it is the good. Will I read it one more time? Read it before? one more time, okay. please. The, the, the airport, what was it doing at Donegal Airport? <laughs> <laughs> Some years ago, I was driving past Donegal Airport early on a winter's morning. I pulled up, jogged to the beach and took a quick look around. No one was about. I, <laughs> I stripped naked, le- left my clothes and glasses in a pile on the sand and jumped into the freezing ocean. <laughs> After about 20 minutes, I was coming out when I heard that unmistakable voice. <laughs> Young Joseph, what a sight for sore eyes. It was Gay Byrne out for his morning walk on the Strand. I see you're making trouble again, he said as he strolled on. Do make sure to keep it up. <laughs> All right, we'll be back with Desi Hutchinson. All right, so Desi Hutchinson scored five points um, yesterday for Bally Gunrez to beat Patrick Swell by eight points. Pretty convincing in the end. He joins us on the line now. So that was it, uh, Desi. Pretty convincing, even though at half time we were probably a little bit nervous. Yeah, it was. We, we started the game well. I think we were five or six points up there at one stage, and we kind of they had a purple patch there just before half time. Got a good few scores on the board. I think we went to queue up. But it was kind of whoever came out and started the second half the best was going to go on and win the game. And thankfully, we done that. We really took control there in the middle of the second half. And we I think we got a good few scores without any reply. So we were delighted with that. And we finished the game strong as well. Yeah, you definitely did. So you were 6-1 up. You were you were flying it, really. It took Patrick's 12, 20 minutes even to get a point. And then suddenly you're only going in, I think it was 7-6 actually at half time. Um, what was said at that stage? I was just kind of... They changed their system a little bit in the first half. They kind of tried to block the space in, in, in our full forward line. So the boys out the field kind of took a little bit of time to adapt to that. We kind of played into their hands a small bit. But at halftime then, we just kind of changed it up and stick to stick to what we know. And thankfully that worked. We, we trusted our hurling and we came out on top of that. In the second half, we were a bit more cuter with the ball and a bit shorter at times. Yeah. And thankfully the lads got the scores from out the field. There was more scores from out the field, but in the first half, the feature was obviously your four points from play and, you know, you'd pass it around a few short stick passes and then put it into the space in either corner for you to, your like your your movement into both corners is really good. Yeah, look, it's something, look, it's something we've worked on and thankfully we can adapt to both ways, whether it's hitting it, getting a sh- couple of short passes and then hitting it in long or whether we're trying to score from out the field. So, look, we're able to adapt to both ways. It all depends on the way Patrick Swell were, were sitting up so we just clicked on quickly to what they were doing and thankfully then the space opened up again towards the end of the game for us inside as well so it was very good Yeah, yeah it's almost Cork-esque I thought um, from watching you yesterday at some parts like it's not easy to execute that kind of a game plan in the winter you know under pressure No it's not and look your hurling has to be really on top of the game for the for the short passes and stuff but Look, it's the way the modern hurling's going. If you're running with the ball, you're, you're you have to play play around the the systems that are put in place. So look, it was tough, and they they were a very good team. But thankfully, we just stuck to what we knew, and we've been working on it a good few years now. Well, I'm only back, but the lads they've been they've been putting this in place for a good while, and we're starting to be successful with it. Yeah. So you wear wear number ten because I was looking at you following kind of since you've been back with Bally Gunner and I'm looking at the reports and you're you're picked at wing forward and you're getting these scores, but you play in the full forward line. You play in a two man full forward line. Um, it looks to me and kind of just never stop never stop moving in there and then take your man on when you get the ball. Is that fair analysis of your game? Uh, I, yeah, I suppose it is. Look, all six forms are comfortable in all six positions really. So we have the license to. To get around the forwards wherever it is, and look, thankfully, myself and Peter Hogan have been been going well inside, and yeah. our movement is starting to really click with each other. So it's nice to have him in there. We're playing off the same page, kind of. So we're we're starting to click. But as I said, we have the license to cover any of the positions in the forward, and we have the the adaptability to do that. So we're delighted. 
Yeah, your young players came good yesterday. Like my, uh, Michael Mahoney, he's been he was there last year. Um, he obviously got a good few points for from play. Um, important one. Paddy Levy, I thought was interesting. He man Mark Keen Lynch. He's only out of minor, so like I mean that was a huge call before the game. Yeah, it was. And look, Paddy's been flying for us all year. And Mike, yesterday, he, he topped up with four, four unbelievable points in the second half. And he's probably not known for his scoring abilities. Usually, like he's he's a real dog out in the field. He, he works so hard. He gets big tackles in and he kind of sets up the play for other people. But yesterday, he stood up when, when we needed him and got four unbelievable points. And look, Paddy, Paddy's only out of minor. And he's like a lad that's been there years. So he is, in fairness, no man. Hopefully he'll keep that up for us, but he is a top hurler and he's probably one to watch. Yeah, he was described as an old miner uh, by your manager, that he's been around a while, he's on, still um, only 18. Yeah, he is. He, he played minor there for a good few years and I think they, they won two of them and he was kind of a, a main figure of that. And look, he's, he's really slotted in well with us. He's like myself, there's three or four of us new into the, into the team this year and I think we need that you need that in every squad a bit of uh, freshness and look we're bringing that and look at the people we have around us is is massive too with the experience of the lads yeah so you mentioned you're back in so you like I mean everybody at this stage knows your story uh, Desi that you're with Brighton and you're released um, last May then you went playing soccer with Waterford and you played the, did you play the season out with them and then you obviously would have seen Bally Gunner win the Munster last year from the outside and now you're involved in it this year yeah, it's mad. It's mad. I came back in May 2018, I think it was, and played with Waterford here for the remainder of that season. And then just kind of was weighing up what I was going to do, whether I was to come back or whether I was trying to keep going with the soccer. But in my own mind, I was really heading towards getting back involved with the lads. And thankfully I did. But as you said, yeah, this time last year, I was looking from the stand. I think it was Ballier game, everyone was up in the heap. Philip got a last minute winner, and yeah. then I came back in after the Munster final. So since then, I've been just head down, working hard, trying to catch up with the lads, and it's working at the moment. Yeah, because like you played with Waterford underage right up until under 16, you would have been Shane Bennett and Patrick Curran's um, age group. Um, you know, so hurling was a huge part of your life before you went to England. Yeah, it was. It was, look, our house at home is a it's a huge GA house. I had two brothers there yesterday. Like they, they played in numerous county finals and Munster championships. So I had that. I, I knew all about it really with the two lads being involved for so many years, you know. Um, but yeah, like our house at home, it's, it's a GA house by, by miles. So it, it was easy in that regard. Yeah. And is it weird being from a GA family and having your brothers, uh, you know, playing with Ballygunner when you're over in England and for me I would be looking at you kind of being jealous of you whereas you're looking back maybe you know over there on your own and you might be thinking the opposite way around Yeah look it's always going to be like that it's, it's a weird one they're probably wishing they were me and I was wishing <laughs> I was them at times it's just the way it goes look a lot of people I suppose would love to have a professional lifestyle but not all it's made out made out to be especially if you're standing out over there but like Look, everyone kind of thinks it's it's the big, nice lifestyle, but uh, it's just as good being at home here when when carrying titles. Yeah, what is it? What is the lifestyle like, uh, Desi? Is it like a dog eat dog world? I'm thinking of, you know, in your position, hoping to keep a contract, you know, going out on loan, that falling through. You know, your kind of life before you came home doesn't sound great but I suppose when it was going well for you and you were on the up you know like give us a, a sense of what yeah, it yeah like it, it, it's, it's a bit of both it's always it's always up and down over there like you, one week you could be on the biggest highway however but the next week it's lowest the lowest like it's, it's just the way it goes and it has the way it'll always be like until you've played probably 60 70 games for your first team then you know you're you're really doing well do you know that kind of way but yeah as a 16 year old going over there it's tough to get that breakthrough and as you say loan rules and trying to get them and not working out it's all it's all part of it but it is tough like you know yeah that's it you like I mean I saw you describing it being not not in control of your own life which you're obviously not because other people are making decisions for you you're being sold you're being moved you know you're you're not deciding that exactly that's it like you never really know what's going on 
it's it's always in it's always in other people's control and look you think you could be doing unbelievably well but you might have a manager that thinks you're not and then next minute a new manager comes in and he thinks you're doing unbelievably well it's you just never know what way it's going to go like some managers only last two months there you know and then you have to try and another manager comes in maybe with a different style of play and you have to try and adapt to that and it might not suit you the way the first manager brought you in you know everything yeah. just there's so many little things that are, that are caught up in it that you just never know where you stand but as I said once you've played them kind of 60 70 games for your first team then then you're on your way to being successful I suppose but up until then it's very um, very cutthroat and you never know when you might be out the door it could be a new your contract landed on your lap as well you know that kind of way so yeah yeah no it's weird you made a it was another thing I thought was very interesting that you said was that the dressing room in England in the soccer that uh, players are looking out for themselves more so and I suppose you understand in the context of keeping their job pretty much that in GEA you don't have that pressure money's not a factor and you know it's more of a team environment yeah it is look you're you're over there and there could be there could be 80 young lads from the academy looking for one spot in the first team so you need to look out for yourself like and it's just you actually get at first I was going over and I was coming from GA teams and a local team here in Waterford and it's all team environment then you go over there and you could walk in the door and people wouldn't even talk to you that's the way it is but as, as you go on you understand why and why and I, I became one of them people where you're in there and you don't want to see someone else doing well and they don't want to see you do well but you just have to get on with it and hopefully that you'll catch the eye more than someone else and that's just the way it goes and that's that's just the pure reality of it and then Look, it's different if you're going into a first team environment. You're you're playing for points every week, and there's money on the line. There's all sorts, so you need to come together as a team. But yeah, when you're when you're in an academy and trying to break through, then you need to look after yourself before anything else. So it's more, yeah, it's more the academy and the reserves that you would notice that kind of individual. Yeah, it's just trying on. to get that breakthrough. Now, look, you need a lot of luck as well to get it, get it. Um, but you need to look after yourself when you're. And you're trying to get into that uh, first team environment. Yeah. So you were gone from 16, um, and then when you came back, obviously, the were you surprised at the level of preparation involved in in um, the G? Yeah. I know you played uh, senior football with Waterford last year. You you played against Clare um, in the Munster Championship. Yeah. Look, there's there's obviously always going to be that gap between the let's say professional football and. I'm not sure of GA here, but like everyone is trying to do it in the right way now. It is get more and more professional. But obviously, look, you have people need to go to work and they need to go train in the night times so where over there you can just fully concentrate on your training. So there always is going to be that gap and it's, it's probably never going to change. But the level of actually professionalism once you're training and what's put on, on board for you is there's not a huge amount of difference. Yeah, no, that's that's the thing. I saw your manager, Darrow Sullivan, uh, talking about playing Six Mile Bridge last week. He said you could see the amount of strapping on our lads after that game. And maybe that is the big thing. Now you have two weeks break before Boris Ali is recovery. Um, Stephen Hunt kind of created a bit of controversy in Ireland here, probably when you were away, that he wrote that GA players wouldn't be able for the lifestyle in England because you'd be sitting on the couch all day trying to recover and it's boring and everyone was up in arms about this God I'd love to sit on the couch all day but he was painting the picture a lot of the professional game is just lounging about recovering your body and we the GA can't really do that Yeah exactly and that's it like you could be you could be over in England and you're going to train at 9 o'clock and you could be home at 1 o'clock now it, it, it seems great but all the rest of that day, you're probably sitting in front of the TV or whatever. You might go off for a walk or whatever, but there is a lot of downtime and you, you need to try and make use of, use of that in the best way you can to recover and stuff, but it can become really, really boring. And you can see why people fall into to silly things, gambling, all that kind of stuff, because yeah. of the amount of downtime you have over there. And it, it is it's a huge mental part of the game, but... Look, after a while, you do get used to it, and it becomes just becomes your normal life. And but it is very tough. Like, 
Yeah, exactly. And I suppose, like, obviously today your recovery will probably be done after you finish work rather than during that day. Yeah, exactly. Like, I'll finish up work here at half four and I'll probably go out to the sea and then we'll have a recovery session ourselves tonight, a belly gun or whatever it is. But, yeah, that's just the way it is. You have to go to work and then you have to do your recovery. But, look, thankfully, we have that opportunity to even go to belly gunner tonight, you know what I mean? So, yeah, it's just not the end of the world. No point in complaining about it. Come here, what are you doing? You, you mentioned you finished work at half past four because I was reading a, an article when you arrived home saying that you're going to go back studying or whatever. Like, I'm sure it was a difficult decision to sit down at your age and figure out, you know, what you're going to do with your life. Yeah, it is. And it was, it was really tough to find. That's probably the toughest thing I had to deal with since I came home was figuring out what I was going to do next. And look, I said I'd go work for a, a little while and see how I how I find that I'm working in store logistics here in Waterford so that, that's that's it for the moment but hopefully I'll get back to college now next September please God if everything goes goes well and that that's my aim is to get back studying and and um, get a career for myself I could easily look around the shop for another while but I knew it was never going to last forever and I needed a backup because obviously I didn't finish my leaving certain happened before I left to go to England um, so that's next for me now hopefully Look back into the books. Yeah, very good. And is the GPA helping you out with stuff like that? Uh, yeah, they will. They will eventually. Um, I've had a, a bit of talk with them at the moment, but it's still kind of early days. It's not until next September. The applications and stuff don't open until February. So I have a little bit of time to make sure that it's the right decision or whatever I g- g- try and go do. Yeah, I know you're concentrating on Bally Gunner and everything, but you've scored 424 from play so far this season. Has Liam Cal uh, any numbers flashing up on your phone that you don't recognise or voicemails left or anything like that? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, no, but look, yeah, I think we're just left to concentrate on Bally Gunner for the moment. A lot of lads are the same, so we'll just concentrate on that for the moment. But look, it's great for Waterford Hurling to have a new manager like Liam Cal involved after doing so well with tip under 20s and minors that. He seems to be a real winner, and it could be could be brilliant for Waterford going forward. Because let's be honest, it hasn't been the best few years for Waterford Hurling, but hopefully we can get back to that now. Yeah, in the summer exactly. So you're available for selection is basically what we're taking from that anyway. So if Liam Liam Cal, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll pass on your number yeah, maybe yeah, to yeah, him. Yeah. I wouldn't say no anyway. <laughs> Come here, Desi. Thanks very much for taking the call, and best of luck in the Munster final. No bother. Thanks very much. All right, so Paddy Power Performance of the Weekend. We haven't really done Paddy Power Performance of the Weekend and we have to give this the context that we wouldn't have seen a lot of these games as well. So Hubert Darcy, um, we have to give Padraig Pierce's. I, I, I haven't been giving Padraig Pierce's the attention that they deserved and I'll make sure to correct that before the, the Connacht final. Hubert Darcy, you have a little bit of a, a thing about Hubert Darcy. You love him. Yeah. He scored 1-1 from full forward and... Um, the thing about Hubert Darcy with me is this kind of first impressions bias. When I saw Hubert Darcy um, first, he's playing as a working kind of wing forward for uh, Ross Common. He's a big lump of a fella. I and now I have, thing. I have him pegged down as an old working dog. <laughs> he plays full forward for Porter Pierce's and he's well able to score. Oh, I mean, most wing working dog wing forwards are well. <laughs> I, I, like he seemed to score one one every game. It's just always beside his name. I can like, as far as I've seen him just play for Ross Common. But every time I look at a match report, it's Hubert Darcy one one. And yeah, I have seen him take a couple of big fetches for Ross Common in midfield and full forward. And I just like. I like awkward players, like, you know, p- nuisance of players. Like, you know, it's just very tough to handle. They're sort of not natural looking. And it's like, this is what he is. He's a class, class player and he works hard, but it's just, I, I don't even know how you would go about trying to sort of handle him. Yeah, no, exactly. So, Padraig Pierce's beat Tier Connell Gales 2 10 to 8. I thought that would have been a potential banana skin for Padraig Pierce's, but obviously not. Um, good win for them. Own Cleary scored 1 5. These are kind of the inter county boys that stand up. Only 1 3, so he got 1 4 from play. Uh, Milltown Malbay beat Rat Cormac 111 to 11 points so like I mean there was nothing in this obviously we tipped Milltown Malbay to win which they did but it was a draw after normal time it was um, oh yeah Milltown Malbay we got won the first half of extra time by 3 points that pushed it out to 3 in it then and you know they were able to hold out from there yeah but Uncle Leary who's got a, a wand of a left peg 
um, and can kind of uh, rotate from number 11 into number 13 and wherever you want in kind of in between that. So he's, the, he's, their, ma- he's their main man, uh, top quality player. Liam Sill scored 1-1. One, one. Uh, if you're playing Cora Finn, Liam Silk reminds me kind of a Philly McMahon in that this this new age style of play he just bloody loves it. Yeah, it's no very little defensive responsibilities can get forward with impunity, like w- whenever you want, without anyone ever bothering you. He just got inside for the goal. He wasn't even followed yeah. because you can kind of get lost in the middle. No one's really going to take. No one's who's marking his own is going to be too worried about the cornerback ghosting up. His finish was outstanding for his goal. That wasn't as easy as it looked. When a goalkeeper's rushing out at you, when he got the ball in his hand, I was saying in my head, go around him, go around him, because there's not much of an angle there. Yeah. I don't know that he half miss hit it, but it was a lovely little f- finish into the corner anyways. But, like, I mean, he's constantly racking up big scores. And the, the answer here is stop dropping players back. Liam Silk loves it. Yeah, I think he's basically playing half forward the whole game. I can, yeah, the, the finish, I thought he deliberately sort of did that where he went Maybe. over the ball and looked like he was going sort of high and just dropped it beneath the keeper's legs. He started that move as well, like, you know, around the half forward line. He came off his shoulder and popped it, so it's strange that he wasn't picked up but I think that's the beauty it wasn't a great game but Cora Finn you could see like when there's bodies back they do move people around very well and it's usually the full forwards come out and leave that space and then people like Silk and the half forwards were going into it and yeah it's just one one time you leave him free and it's a goal yeah no so he's the top quality um, cornerback Desi Hutchinson is another nomination obviously we spoke to him in part two he scored four from play in the first half and then got another one in the second half he's unmarkable his movement is unbelievable and he's going to be a huge addition to uh, Waterford senior hurlers next year because he's, he's just a top class player and when he gets it into his hand he only knows one thing go at his man cut back stick it over the bar he's a really exciting player um, you know he's a crowd pleaser and uh, one we're all looking forward to watching um, next year <coughs> David Clifford got one three his brother uh, Pawdy got man of the match he got only mm-hmm. got one point so he must have played uh, bloody well to get man of the match ahead of David but David just keeps ticking every single box One three now in a county final where you need to stand up and be counted an individual goal at an important time to push it out to score and like I mean what more can that man do four from playing two All-Ireland finals against the best team we've ever seen he's only 20 like I mean it's just it, I, we, we're going to be tired talking about him to be honest with you but this, <laughs> he will go down if he goes if he doesn't get injured he'll go down as the greatest forward Kerry have ever had I think mm, now they will need to win a few All-Irelands probably because then again for an, indivi- for an individual kind of accolade like that do you need the All-Irelands this kind of idea that Messi can't be as good as Maradona because he's got no World Cup <laughs> I think that's a load of nonsense it depends on the team around you Dublin happened to be incredibly professional and organised when they wouldn't have been in any other era you know of Kerry football so the the, the team they're going to have to go up against you know has been cranked mm. up I'm sure David will win two or three All-Irelands yeah I think it's just people like with Messi he's got an opportunity of winning stuff that people recognise as well whereas Clifford has to win the championship for it to go beside his name do you know when you think of all those players like even Neymar and stuff oh, I need to go to a bigger club now to really like you know, be the best player in the world so I think it does come with the territory where you have to be winning championships and inspiring your team to do it in those big games yeah, yeah no, I no. know it's harsh people have worse teams well like I mean to be honest with you what else could he have done in those two all and finals like I mean he got did he get four from play both days yeah. I think he got four from play yeah. both days um Mark and Johnny Cooper destroying Johnny Cooper Mark and Fitzsimons now they didn't get over the line but that wasn't him not standing up and being counted yeah. you no, get me absolutely. so like for yeah. individual accolades like that you don't ne- you don't necessarily have to have won it looks good you know if he if he did it in a game Kerry won you'd be lauded he d- sometimes unbelievable performances can be lost because you don't win yeah I'm just thinking, <laughs> I'm not bringing Paddy Bradley into this conversation, but like I could never say, for instance, that he's the greatest of all time. Like if we're talking about Even the best no matter, ever, no matter how much you want to. <laughs> yeah, but it is because like you know Derry were never at that level; they never won all Ireland. So I think you do have to do it to be considered one of the best. Like you know, when you look back, you compare Cooper and O'Callaghan will come into it and stuff. You compare how many all Irelands they won. To he's like he's like Messi in that I saw a couple of pictures. His goal was class in the top left corner, but. It's like he's always inviting you to take it off him. He's holding it out there and then he just, as soon as you try to take it off him, yeah. you're beaten. Yeah. So the lesson is just 
just be beaten anyway. He's just <laughs> such a like he's just such an impressively huge man with so much skill. He ju- he just has every. I've never he's 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 freakish. He's freakish in that to have that level of skill and that accuracy, but be that big. Yeah. You know, do, like, I don't want Schubert to compare. Darcy. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> don't want to compare Donny Kingston to him, but Donny Kingston's the only other person who's six foot four or five that has that kind of ball skills. It's not something that you have. Uh, yeah. y- you kind of associate. <laughs> we, can't, we, we got Paddy Bradley and Donny Kingston into this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Our own county man. <laughs> That's terrible. Uh, it actually is, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Michael Dar McCauley and Conal Keeney. I'm giving them a joint nomination. Michael Dara McCauley only came on as a sub. He had a head uh, concussion, but it wasn't because of that that he didn't start. It was because he has carrying a groin injury and uh, probably expected to win it and they're just giving him a bit of a rest. Conal Keeney uh, injured his hamstring in the semi-final, didn't even get on in the, in the county final, so he's back in the mix. He scored two points. Michael Dara McCauley made a huge impression. This was three all at half time, and Bally Bowden had a man sent off. I was thinking these are in trouble here. Um, it was 7-5 when Michael Dara came on and he won a penalty immediately and then set up Colin Baskell for a goal um, how he won the penalty was a little bit funny as pure Michael Dara McCauley so he's running in a huge slalom and run after winning the ball <laughs> in midfield you know the way he's running just so fast yeah. he's doing a big huge aggressive bounce and then he goes to solo it and he solos it two, two foot up <laughs> over his head but the fact that he soldered it so badly, it, it tricked the goalkeeper, Colm Judge, who tripped him up <laughs> as he was looking up to reach up. <laughs> Is there anything more Michael Darren McCauley oh. than that? Like, you know, a skill letting him down, but an incredible kind of driving force. And then catches another ball in midfield, drives forward, um, pass it off to Basquel goal. That game over then, that goes to uh, one. Oh, Colin Basquel actually chipped the penalty over the bar to put four in it. And then Colin Basquel scored a goal then or seven and it's game over. Good yeah. luck. The only thing that's missing for Michael Dara McCauley is like accidentally headbutting someone in the <laughs> nose. And remember the Jeremy Conley one before the all Ireland final where we went to hug him from behind and during the warm up? Oh, yeah. And whenever yeah, we yeah, came yeah, on these yeah, back, yeah. Conley Connelly got didn't like that at all. Yeah, yeah. And he's holding his neck. And I was like, that's so Michael Dara McCauley. He's trying to be friendly, <laughs> but he's too, he's too much of a giant and too clumsy for this world. Like, and he's yeah. just messing everything up. Exactly, exactly. So that's the last, that's the last uh, nomination. Um, look, I'm sorry to you, Conan and Hubert Darcy, but I'm going to give it to Desi Hutchinson. We know that if you played the televised game and you play really well, you have to be in the mix above a fella who we haven't seen at all. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't seen at all. Desi Hutchinson was unplayable in the first half yesterday. Um, um, so, yeah, so he deserves a uh, Paddy Power performance of the weekend. So that's it, Conan. Well uh, done, Desi. Well done, Desi. We will be back on Thursday where we'll preview the weekend's uh, matches. We'll talk to you then. Good luck.